and welcome to The Art of Being Human. We started a segment last time on alcoholism, but I didn't quite finish it because a lot of the difficulties in our society now are due to alcoholism. And as I've said before, it's like the third cause of death in the United States. The second one being suicide, believe it or not, and the first one being abortion. So we need to deal more with the alcoholism. I'm going to continue from where I left off last time. When I, uh, when I tell you that alcohol is a food, but it has no nutritional value, but it has to be classified as a food because it has calories, and it doesn't have to digest. If somebody is drinking alcohol, about 20% of it is absorbed right from the stomach wall right into the body, the organs, so that within a few moments, within a minute or less, there is alcohol in every organ of the body for a person who has just started drinking. It's not like it even has to wait for the digestive process. Now, what doesn't go through the stomach wall into the bloodstream and into the body and the brain and all the organs, it, the rest of it goes through the regular digestive process. The stomach can only hold so much. But about 20% of what a person drinks immediately when it hits the stomach goes right through the stomach wall and into the bloodstream and within moments or within a minute or two there is alcohol on every organ of the body it has some alcohol so that is the rapidity with which uh, alcohol hits at low doses it gives relaxation loss of inhibition lack of concentration drowsiness slurred speech and disturbed sleep. Now, chronic use will result in these conditions. Now, I'm going to be using some terms that you're not familiar with, but I also am going to define them when I finish get, uh, talking to you about them. So chronic use will give something called peripheral neuropathy. Diabetics get it a lot, but so do alcoholics. Alcoholic myopathy, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff psychosis, which a lot of uh, AIDS people get as well, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, esophagitis, gastritis, pancreatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, and cirrhosis of the liver. Let me just read those again, and then I'm going to start defining what those terms actually mean. So chronic use of alcohol results in peripheral neuropathy, alcoholic myopathy, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff psychosis, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, esophagitis, gastritis, pancreatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, and chirosis of the liver. Now, what are these things? I'm going to now define them for you. Peripheral neuropathy is nerve damage done to basically the fingers and the toes and the hands and the feet. You're, these are the parts of the body that's considered to be the periphery, in other words, the outer edges of the body, hands and feet fingers, toes. And what happens when you have neuropathy is that the nerves become damaged by the alcohol. Now, if you are a diabetic, you can get the same thing because the nerves are damaged by excess sugar. And gradually, you get to the point where you can't feel and so you can't feel the edges of your hands, or they're prickly, or they hurt. You don't have full feeling, or you don't have normal feeling, either in your hands or in your feet. So the symptoms are going to be pain, burning, tingling, and prickly sensation. And a lot of this can be helped if you're taking B vitamins. Alcoholics, you see, uh, generally will a drink more than they'll eat, and so they do get some of the symptoms that other people would get with other illnesses. Now, what about alcoholic myopathy? This is muscle pain and swelling, weakness, red color in the urine, and the problem is that the muscles are beginning to waste away. I read a, a book where it talked about a man who was alcoholic, and when he drank, his organs were so porous. If you have something that's porous, like a porous piece of cloth, it's like it has little tiny openings or little tiny holes in it, and whatever you put on that cloth just drains through. Well, this particular individual who didn't live long after this was discovered, he had a, a porous organs. All of his organs were just little, like little openings, and when he drank, 
drank alcohol, it just drained through the organs, through those holes. I have never heard of anything like that before, but I did read about this. And so I imagine it happens to more than one person if they've really been alcoholic for a long time. The red color in the urine, as I said before, is because of the muscles uh, wasting away. And so once again, I keep reading that vitamin B deficiency is a pot cause and that's a help to take it. Wernicke's encephalopathy. This is an extreme uh, shortage or uh, deficiency of vitamin B. What happens is the eye muscles become paralyzed. The person becomes sleepy. It's somnolescence. They go into a stupor. If they are not treated for it quickly, then they will die quickly because there's no getting out of it. Wernicke's encephalopathy, extreme paralyzing of the eyes, uh, stupor, and death, which occurs fairly quickly when the person gets to that uh, uh, point. Now, Korsakoff psychosis is also something that AIDS patients get. It's considered to be a secondary infection, but for an alcoholic, it's, it's a problem that's, that's caused by the alcohol, of course, and you get confusion, memory loss, confabulation. Now, I need to define that term. In confabulation, the person is talking, but you wouldn't know anything was wrong if you didn't know them because it's not gibberish. They're using English language. They're making full sentences. It's like they're talking normally, but the whole thing is they're making the whole thing up. A lot of mental patients do that. They have confabulation. They make up things. Now, I don't know how much they're aware of the fact of, that they're making things up or whether it just comes to their mind and they're saying it or whether they think it's true. But in some mental illnesses, you will have people who are talking and they seem to be talking about normal events, except those normal events never happen. They're just not there. So that's confabulation. It's also you have some uh, confabulation in Wernicke's encephalopathy, and so it, it just runs from bad to worse here. Now, ca alcoholic ca cardiomyopathy. In this, the heart enlarges, it becomes bigger, but as it becomes bigger, it becomes weaker. A lot of people with congestive heart failure have that same problem. The heart is getting larger. It's got fluids in it. It's not supposed to, and it becomes weaker. My brother had that before he died. They never spotted it until after his death that his heart had really enlarged. You have heart arrhythmias where you don't have a normal beat. You have tachycardia where the beat is not right. It's going too fast. You have edema. That's where you have uh, swelling, a lot of swelling. That's what edema means. And palpitations, that pounding of the heart. And uh, the only way that you can get rid of it is to have complete and permanent abstinence from alcohol. The person cannot drink at all. It's very bad on the heart. It's very bad on the blood vessels. And so therefore, you know, people who drink are at risk for developing these conditions, especially if they've drank for quite a while. So let me just read that off again. Alcoholic cardiomyopathy, the heart enlarges, it weakens, you have congestive heart failure, you have the heart arrhythmia, tachycardia, edema, and palpitations. You basically have destroyed the heart. And so the only way you can treat it is not uh, to uh, drink at all. It is treatable in early stages, but once you get advanced, then it's very difficult to treat. Now, esophagitis is inflammation and pain in the esophagus due to the effects of alcohol and vomiting. You damage the esophagus, and that's what and you get inflammation and pain in the esophagus. So I imagine it's very hard to digest food. It's very hard to swallow but it's a result of the alcoholism. Gastritis is inflammation of the stomach lining, and you get a lot of nausea, and you get a lot of vomiting. The stomach coating has been eroded. You know, your stomach is coated, and so it, it, and it's necessary for that to protect it in the digestive uh, process because acids in the stomach actually digest the food in the first stage before it gets to the small intestine. So the 
stomach is eroded, and it's eroded by hydrochloric acid, and the blood vessels are damaged, and you can get some hemorrhaging in the stomach itself. Very uncomfortable. If you have stomach problems, ulcers, and things like that, you know how uncomfortable that can be. Pancreatitis would be the next thing. Pain, nausea, vomiting, and distension. When you have pancreatitis, you have damaged the pancreas. It can cause malnutrition, and it can cause weight loss. Diabetics get it somewhat. It can be acute, or it can be chronic. So gastro uh, pancreatitis is something that's considered to be a severe disorder due to alcoholism, or in some cases, due to diabetes. Now, alcoholic hepatitis. This is inflammation of the liver. The liver is enlarged and the liver is tender. It's very dangerous not to have a liver that's working because it can get filled with scar tissue, it stops working and it's very bad. But the symptoms will be nausea, vomiting, lethargy, anorexia, high white blood count, which usually indicates infection, a fever, and jaundice if you have a problem with the liver. The liver is important in every aspect of your human functioning. And if there's anything wrong with the liver and the liver has a problem, then you, you will be sick from it. So let me read that off again. The liver becomes enlarged. It becomes tender. And the symptoms are nausea, vomiting, lethargy, anorexia, high white uh, blood count, fever, and jaundice. And because you know what anorexia is, when a person person just doesn't eat and can't eat and doesn't want to eat. Some people are anorexic and they view themselves as being very heavy and they feel that they have to lose more and more and more weight. You can die from it. It is treatable, but it is kind of difficult to treat people with anorexia because they are the victims of their own perception. And their own perception is that if they're not thin, they're not good enough. So therefore, they take it upon themselves to make sure that they don't eat. Or they eat a lot and then vomit it all up. So you get the esophagus problems, you get the stomach problems, you get erosion of the teeth, so you have dental problems, problems with your mouth, all of that due to the fact of the vomiting. And uh, it, it, people are hospitalized with it, but a lot of people die from it because you have to get them to eat. What I used to do when I was counseling anorexics, uh, they, they feel that if they don't eat, that they have control over their bodies. But if they do eat, they've lost control. So I tried to reverse that. You are in control if you eat. You're not in control if you don't. But I also required that they get medical attention because I wouldn't see them without a medical backup. I'm not a doctor. I can't treat them medically. But they run into all kinds of medical issues from lack of nutrition. And what they're doing to themselves is they vomit and they damage their stomachs and their, and their bodies aren't getting the nutrition that they need. So I would always require that they have regular medical care. A lot of times they resisted this. But if they didn't get it, and if I didn't have permission to talk to their doctors as to what I was finding, I wouldn't see them because it wouldn't take the risk of losing a patient because they didn't want to cooperate with me. And doctors do dismiss patients if they do not cooperate. You know, if they're not going to follow a regimen, if they're not going to follow a plan, and the doctor can see they're going to get worse and worse and worse, they actually refer them to a psychiatric care or they just dismiss them because they won't lose a patient because of non-cooperation. Now, the next one is cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver. This is end-stage uh, disease. In other words, the last step before death. And the liver cells are destroyed. The liver cells are replaced by fibrous scar tissue in which the liver cannot process food. It cannot process what it's supposed to process. It cannot work. And you get nausea, vomiting, anorexia, weight loss, pain, jaundice. That's when you turn yellowish. Edema, which is the swelling. Anemia, in which you don't have the correct iron or, or substances in the blood. Abnormal blood coagulation, so your blood doesn't coagulate right. It's very dangerous. It leads to death. And that, as I said, is end stage liver. And a lot of people have it who are end stage alcoholics. They're at the last state. They can't go much further before their bodies just shut down and they die. 
So there's one more, alcoholic intoxication. Now what happens if a person is intoxicated with alcohol? They lose their inhibitions, they become sexually or aggressive, and other aggressive uh, impulses that they follow, which means they're in fights, they get arrested, you know, they, they uh, smash up bars, they do all kinds of stuff like that. They have mood lability, which means the moods are not stable. They're they're up, they're down. You know, they're this way, they're that way. It's mood lability. Their moods keep changing. They have impaired judgment, impaired social functioning, impaired work functioning. Many of them end up by losing their jobs. And at this stage of the game, a lot of them lose their families as well because you can't raise children in a family where somebody's always drunk. They have slurred speech, they're uncoordinated, they have an unsteady gait, and nystagmus, which is the fluttering of the eyes, and a flushed face where you have a very reddish face. The blood levels of 100 to 200 milligrams of alcohol in your system will give intoxication. And if you go up 700, 400 to 700 milligrams, that can cause death. So definitely people can uh, die of, alcoholic, of alcoholism. Now, uh, alcoholic withdrawal, what is it like? You can understand when I read off these symptoms that a person would want to drink. And I saw a lady, and I was in Tennessee, I was teaching in college, visiting with somebody, and this lady came in with a little girl, and she was begging for alcohol because she started the withdrawal symptoms, and instead of being willing to go through them, them, or to get medical attention and help going through them, she wanted to drink because if she drank, it would take those symptoms away. And I felt bad for the little girl because the little girl was now trying to take care of her mother and saying, and she was only about four or five years old, saying things like, it's okay, mommy, I take care of you, I take care of you. No child should ever be put in that situation. And I think had it been today, and I'm not sure what happened, I wasn't able to follow up, but the child would have been taken away and put in foster care or a relative maybe would have taken care of because uh, the mother was just not able to take care of her own child. So the alcoholic withdrawal starts usually about 4 to 12 hours after the last drink. And this is what the person goes through. First, they have the hand tremors, the tremors of the hand, tremors of the tongue, and tremors of the eyelids, the shaking and fluttering. Then there's nausea, vomiting, malaise, and that just means the person doesn't generally feel healthy, they feel sick, weakness, tachycardia, the change of the heartbeat, sweating, high blood pressure, anxiety, depression, irritability, and you can have transient hallucinations. Now, transient hallucinations mean you're having hallucinations due to the alcohol. They come and go. Transient means you have it and they're gone. It's not like a long-lasting thing, so they come and go with the, with the hallucinations. Headache, insomnia, and within three days, they can become delirious. They cannot sustain attention. They have disorganized speech. They're incoherent, and many hallucinate. So those are the symptoms. Now, it's easy enough for a person to read through them. I mean, they're words. You know, anyone can read a group of words. But when you experience it, and you may not experience everything, but you experience several of these things, or you phase in and out of them, you start with the tremors, and then you get the sweating and the high blood pressure, then you get the hallucinations and the weakness and all of that. If you're going through it either step by step by step, or you experience several of these symptoms, it must be terrible to go through it. I mean, I don't drink at all. I feel sorry for those who do because they have to deal with this. But if they can put, put uh, up with it or if they can get the medical attention that they need so that they can get help as they're going through that process, they can come out on the other side of it.
Now, some people who are on pain uh, drugs for, for pain after surgery, they get to the point where they start getting withdrawal symptoms. Because if the pain is severe, they give them pain medication, which they must. They have to have pain control. But if they get too much of it, or they kind of get dependent on it as they're going through the surgery and the problems post-op, and then they don't need it anymore because basically physically they're better, but they still have that dependence on the drug then they have to get off the drug because they're addicted to it or they can become addicted to it. Now, there are ways and medical uh, uh, ways of handling all of this if a person is willing to get the medical help they need. But these are terrible symptoms. And uh, for a person who's going through them, they'll do anything just to get a drink to stop the symptoms because they are so frightening and they are so terrible. And people are afraid of it. So first of all, when you take a drug, you may take it to help stop the anxiety. Then after a while, you have to have it because if you don't have it, then you get the anxiety as a withdrawal symptom. So in a sense, you can lose out on both ends. And if you keep on and drinking and drinking and drinking, you lose part of yourself. You know, you're not going to want to be with people. You're concerned only with getting that next drink or only with getting that next fix if you're on drugs, only getting that next time. And so you don't want people in interfering with that, you start missing social engagements, you start stopping going to your children's games, and people are nagging at you, and you complain about people nagging at you, because as you know, you know, I, I have the right to drink if I want to, I have the right to do what I want to with my body, leave me alone, it's none of your business. But what they're really trying to do is force people away from them so that they can be alone to take their drugs. And when they do that, then they have isolationism. And eventually, people do leave them alone because they realize they are not helping. They're trying to help. They don't know what to do next. And they're afraid of the confrontations. They don't want the confrontations. And so therefore, they have isolationism. They hate the isolationism, uh, the isolating uh, part of it. But on the other hand, they seek it out because they want to be alone when they take their drugs. It's just a terrible cycle one phase after another phase after another phase. So if you find yourself caught in this kind of a cycle, please get the help. The help is available and there's no shame to it. Now there are various self-tests to discover whether you are addicted or not because it's possible for a person to be addicted and not realize it. And these self-tests will ask various questions and then you can know for sure whether you are addicted or not, although to everybody else it may be obvious, but to the individual, uh, if you start to feel like you need to cut back, if people are criticizing you or commenting to you the fact that you're drinking more than you should, if you don't like to drink but you have to drink because of the withdrawal symptoms, then you are an alcoholic. There's no doubt about it, you are. But help is available. Now I think what I'm going to do here. Um, I'm going to close it here, and we're going to continue. I have a little more to do with alcoholism before we finish, and so I'll continue with it next time and not get in the middle of it. So we'll close here. Please join me next time.